Hello, thank you for watching House of Mirth Song Cycle. My name is Emily King. I'm the co-creator, adapter, and lyricist. Uh, and it is our great pleasure and privilege to be able to do a talk back uh, after the show uh, with Lev Raphael, and he'll tell you more about him. But we would like to we're going to talk about uh, Edith Wharton, Rosedale, and anti-Semitism. Three Mr. subjects that are dear to my heart. <laughs> go for it i'm la Raphael. i am the author of 27 books in genres from literary criticism to crime fiction one of my crime fiction novels is called the edith wharton murders which brings together two rival wharton societies and of course murder results uh that's the book that put me on the map with the new york times so edith wharton has been very good to me in my career i've also published a book about wharton uh exploring shame in her life and her fiction i am the author of rosedale in love which completely rewrites the house of mirth um i'm an escaped academic i left academia 20 oh maybe 30 plus years ago to write and review full time and i reviewed for the washington post and the detroit free press i've had my own um, interview show on uh, public radio and have had uh, various very strands to my career, but Wharton has been a particular love of mine from uh, college onward, and I was very lucky in graduate school to take the first Wharton seminar taught by Cynthia Griffin Wolf, who wrote the famous biography uh, Triumph of Words. I've also been really lucky to uh, go to Wharton conferences and meet all the major Wharton scholars over time. Uh, Wharton has given me a great deal in my life. And I've also taught her and I've taught the House of Mirth. And so I feel, and I've pretty much read everything that she's written, including her travel writing and a lot of her letters. Letters, we, we could talk about that all by itself. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, so what drew you to Wharton in the first place? Well, I, it's interesting. You know, I'm a first generation American. I'm the son of Holocaust survivors, so I could not be any more different from Wharton and her milieu. But I actually grew up in the middle of the Gilded Age, you could say, in the sense that um, my apartment building uh, was this mammoth structure built in 1903. And its lobby was ornate with a gold coffered ceiling. Um, I went to a, my public library was a McKim, Mead and White library that really was designed to look like an Italian palazzo. And the streets in my neighborhood were very old. There were brownstones that Wharton would have uh, recognized and even some wooden houses. And uh, in many places, the pavement was, the asphalt was wearing away and you could see the co um, cobblestones. So the past was very much present. History was around me um, and Wharton spoke to me. I was blown away by the House of Mirth when I read the scene where Lily Bart is uh, asked not to come back to the yacht. And it was a mammoth shame scene. And it spoke to me because I'd grown up with a lot of shame from a lot of different uh, sources. And to me, that's the magic of great literature that you don't necessarily need to read a book about yourself or about someone like you, but actually reading a book about someone completely unlike you who connects with you emotionally in some way um, is revelatory kind of broadens your view of humanity. Would you like to talk about uh, your book, Edith Wharton, Prisoners of Shame? Yes, I would love to. It was a labor of love. I was not teaching anymore. I had left teaching to write full-time and review full-time. And I had been publishing articles in academic journals about the affect, the feeling of shame in uh, her work, which I was the only person who had ever noticed it. I mean, there's all this humiliation, embarrassment, blushing, people looking down, all the physical signs of shame. And as I read about Wharton herself, and the book is part biography, part literary criticism, as I read about Wharton herself, I realized that she was in immensely shame bound. She was uh, unfortunately the daughter 
of a woman who was considered the most beautiful woman in New York. And Edith Wharton was not beautiful and felt that. She was also highly intellectual, which was not respected in New York at the time. She actually said she was too intellectual for New York and too well-dressed for Boston. So she actually fit much better in Paris, where both things could go together and she could be respected and admired for those things. For instance, when she met Henry James, she was too embarrassed to speak to him the first time. So she thought wearing a beautiful dress would get his attention. Well, it didn't work because he wasn't interested in what right. women were wearing. So I saw all the way through her work that this was this was a theme. And because I had uh, uh, done research in shame, I knew that there was a book in it. And it was published by St. Martin's Press and really broke new ground. I saw, um, I especially saw that shame was something that uh, was very apparent in early work of hers, like The Touchstone, a wonderful novella about a woman writer, and some of her later work that was really not valued by scholars at the time. This was in the early 1990s. Wharton was having a revival, but her earlier work and some of her later work, like Glimpses of the Moon, was still not considered as valuable or as important as The Age of Innocence or The House of Mirth or Ethan Frome or Summer or The Custom of the Country. But I thought her work, all of that work was really beautiful if you saw the missing piece and the missing piece was shame. And the feeling of shame is the feeling that there's something uh, irre irrevocably uh, wrong with you that can never be fixed. And it, and it manifests in many ways. It manifests in guilt, it manifests in its self-consciousness, it manifests in embarrassment. Um, and it is, it is um, if you look at it from the past uh, perspective of affect theory, it is a natural feeling. Uh, there is uh, there is nothing so that you can't really say someone has no shame. They have it, but they're hiding it. They have figured out a way to deal with it. And one of the ways to deal with shame is often anger or contempt. And one of the causes of shame is ridicule, humiliation. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Mentalism, if that's such a word. Absolutely. And, you know, that's what you see in the House of Mirth. Uh, Lily is shamed by other women who use her as a secretary. She's shamed by Gus Trenner uh, when he tries to attack her, he tries to rape her, and he in effect accuses her of sleeping with other men. And she is shamed by the fact that her her father lost all his money. So she's uh, gone, uh, come down quite a few pegs in society. And she is shamed by the reality that she is so much more intelligent and well-read and uh, so much more of a person than the people that she's trying to get to marry. And she knows that these people are beneath her. And yet she has to go, she has to find herself. She has to settle somewhere. Otherwise, she, you know, she's 30. What's going to happen to her? If she doesn't, if she doesn't marry, she's not going to be an apprentice in a flower shop. I mean, that's certainly not going to work for her. No. Feeling exposed. I mean, that's the thing about shame. You feel exposed as inferior and there's nothing you can do about it. So let's roll it to Lily and Rosedale, the, the ridicule, humiliation. These are things that they actually both share. Yes, they, absolutely. They may not know that know it, but they are uh, both victims of of society's judgment. You know, and um, absolutely, Rosedale's on his way up, and Lily's on her way down, and at the point where they meet, uh, is let's look, there's a couple meetings, but the the significant one is when Lily goes back to Rosedale and says, "Yes, I'll marry you," and he says, "Sorry, not quite. I can't do it. You're damaged goods." Damaged goods. Yes, he's, it's really he's humiliated because because she said no to him. He said no to him, and also, and she's and she's humiliated because she has to do this thing. And although you know she must sort of like him, um, she's not in love with him. And it's you know, so they both meet on this level of shame, which Absolutely. is which is really tragic. And I like in your book that that. Oh, he's he 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 realizes late in the late in the book that he can't marry her. And in Rosedale and Love, you mean? Yes, in Rosedale yeah. and Love. And um, but he's determined to have his revenge on the people who made that happen. Which I yes, think yes, because he he knows he knows what they've done to her. Yeah, and he's crazy about her. I mean, it's yeah. it's not just a 
crack. Well, why wouldn't he be? She, she's a superstar in New York society. She's a, she's beautiful. She's elegant. She's intelligent. She is every and she has access to everyone. I mean, she is she is in a sense an aristocrat in New York society without money. Okay, and that's what makes her so vulnerable. If she had money, she could have married whoever she wanted to. That could have worked. It could have. But, but well, not for Edith. Edith not is going to let that happen. When people ask me, well, uh, is any of your work autobiographical? And I say, well, of course, it's all autobiographical down to the verbs, nouns, and punctuation <laughs> because I wrote it. I think she, she the, the reason the House of Mirth is so powerful is that her own feelings of shame are in the book, as you say, in Rosedale and in Lily. And how could she not relate to Lily? I mean, she came into her own when women writers were not as respected as male writers. Was, people thought of her as a minor Henry James, where so often people called her Mrs. Wharton as opposed to Edith Wharton. Um, you know, there's, and she really had to leave America to go someplace where she would be respected. That, which is another thing that she has in common with Lily, which yes. is she puts in her, you know, we're too poor to live in New York, so we're going to go to Europe after uh, the Civil War. And um, that disables her somehow. From yes, New it York. disconnects but her. For yep. both of them. Yep. They both got, you know, a, a, I think Edith at some point says, you know, I, I, I grew up in this incredibly beautiful, world of Europe in France in Italy all over the place but with these you know seeing the best and most beautiful of things including clothes of course mm -hmm. and then to come back to ugly old brownstone New York she just she oh just, yeah like, you know it's never fit in. I, I always find that amusing because to us today brownstones look quite lovely but back then, the stone that was brought across the Hudson from New Jersey was considered pretty gross. Um, and, you know, it wasn't limestone, it wasn't marble, it wasn't anything like that. And yet, today, these are buildings that sell for in, in, you know, tens of millions of dollars. But aesthetically, they at the time, they were considered, you know, safe. Safe, that, yes, that safe period, and conservative. That yes. period of, oops, I guess, they started building them in the 1840s. Before that, it was like brick. But like Washington Square, but but for the as as New York City grew to the north, there weren't enough bricks in the world to make that, those no. houses. But they were safe, and that was something that the old New York people, the, right. the um, they felt comfortable living, with the that. Livingstons, the the Van, the Van Alsteins, who are fictional, you know, that's that's what they felt comfortable with, and they didn't mm -hmm. they didn't want to risk the the next generation was like Vanderbilts. And Astors and people, they they actually they built French chateaus, right? They were the nouveau riche, and they just went all out. Yes. Um, how do you deal personally with depictions of anti-Semitism in her work and other, you know, writers from the not even just the nineteenth century, nineteenth and twentieth century, personally? Well, you know, I was an English major, obviously, in college, and I encountered anti-Semitism in Chaucer and any number of authors, Henry James, uh, uh, authors all through the ages, and it, it, it stung. I did have some perspective in the sense that uh, my parents were Holocaust survivors, so th they had suffered uh, immeasurable horrors. And in comparison, reading about a an, uh, character who's described in demeaning terms wasn't, didn't really match that at all. Um, so, so, so I had that to look at. I, you know, I had to just suck it up. I thought, well, this is part of who these authors are. Right now, people are, publishers are editing Agatha Christie, right? Because she says things about Jews and Black people in, in London. Uh, in England, she says things about Asians that we now find objectionable. If you take those things out of those books, then you distort history. It's important to know that uh, Agatha Christie was a woman in her time. And that's really what, what worked for me in terms of looking at Edith Wharton. She and Henry James both had pretty dim views of Jews. Um, that's who they were. That's how they were brought up. That's what their society looked, uh, thought of Jews. I mean, as an alien race with many unfortunate characteristics. 
But that isn't all that they were. If it were, then they would have sounded like um, monomaniacal. That's just an aspect of, of who they were. So, um, and, and honestly, in, in a weird way, if Edith Wharton hadn't been anti-Semitic, I would never have written one of my favorite novels, which is my Rosedale in Love, which reimagines the book from this perspective of Rosedale and uh, his cousin and his family which was really an immersion in the Gilded Age because I didn't just spend a couple of years reading about the Gilded Age. I spent time reading many, many fiction and nonfiction authors from that period. And one of the things I did that was most interesting to me was I probably read about a dozen guides to manners. See, this was a period when so many people were on the way up because of, uh, of being newly wealthy uh, that they didn't know how to behave. And guides to manners and etiquette sold in the tens of thousands of copies. People were desperate to know how to behave. And they and they were really specific, like, how do you write a letter uh, of compassion when someone has lost a limb? I'm not kidding. I mean, these these were actual things that appear. And one of the things that, that nobody gets when they read The House of Mirth is that there's something really subtle going on when Lily meets Rosedale outside his apartment building, he speaks to her first. Now, every etiquette book I read from that period says, if a gentleman does not know a lady well, he doffs his hat and waits for her to speak first. Now, I think readers in 1905, many of them would have gotten that. But to us in you know 2023, who cares who speaks to whom? I mean, we don't get it. But that is a really subtle piece of what's going on. And I think it's another way in which Wharton has uh, uh, Lily on her back foot. Because not only is she discovered coming out of the uh, building where Selden lives, but she also is spoken to when she should not have been. And so she may feel superior to him in the sense that he doesn't know how to behave properly, but it's also disturbing and embarrassing and shocking. They both totally say the wrong things. Absolutely, absolutely. And, it, and one of the things I like about Rose Dillenov is as you expand his character, is he always seems to be saying the wrong thing. Yes, and he's aware that he's saying the wrong things. That's what I wanted him to be. I wanted him, I wanted to explore his sense of being uncomfortable. His mother committed suicide, which is shameful in my book. His father ran away. His father was not uh, a German Jew like his family, but was an Eastern European Jew, which was an inferior kind of Jew, according to German Jews in that period. And German Jews were really unhappy in America when there was so much immigration from Eastern Europe. They did everything they could to quote unquote civilize these people because they didn't, they really didn't like them. They didn't like the fact that they spoke Yiddish. Um, they just thought they were un terribly uncouth. So, so I have uh, one of the things I enjoyed most in writing Rosedale in Love was having his cousin, Florence instruct him in how to behave. And so so he knows when he speaks to Lily that he goofed. He used slang, which he shouldn't use. He spoke out of turn. He does all these things and he kicks himself afterwards. See, Wharton sees him only from the outside as a stereotype. And I wanted to give him full life because I thought he's a really interesting character. You know, and so I just, you know, I read a lot about Jews in that period and everything that I read just drew me further into wanting to create his world. You do an incredible job of making New York, the different levels of New York, the new things, the old things and the the two families. Um, not so much Lee's family because you're talking about him, but you create his family and their judgmentalism and their oh, absolutely succeed in a way that it 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 balances out what we know of Lily's family and what Lily right yeah. because didn't uh, doesn't Wharton say that Lily's mother died of shame yeah and and I love 
And I love Florence's mother because Florence's mother is incredibly judgmental, you know. Uh, she can't understand why Florence wants to live in the Waldorf story. Well, if, you know, anyone who's wanting, wanted to get away from their family will really relate to Florence getting, <laughs> she doesn't get far away, but in a, in a sense, the Waldorf story is a very different world than the sedate world of a wealthy German Jews living on the Upper West Side. I liked a lot that it, she's sort of a parallel to Gertie Farish, who's a very yes. sort of minor character in House yeah. of Earth, but very important because that's she's she's living on her own in her own apartment. And yes, she, she's not rich. She's working, doing volunteer work or um, what do they call it? Settlement work. Settlement work. Yeah, and that's who Lily goes to when she absolutely hits bottom. Is to Gertie. That's a wonderful. That's a wonderful scene, and there's so much passion in that book. I mean, it's in a book that's so much about societal restraint and judgment. There's so much passion all the way through. There's so much intense affect. There's so much anger and jealousy and shame, and it's really, um, it's really an amazing book. I, I wish somebody could capture it a little better than the movie with Gillian Anderson, who was really good as Lily, but I, I wish somebody would see it as more than just a costume drama. What about the passion of the book? Uh, well, can, can I talk a little bit about um, adapting for House of Mirth Song Cycle? Oh yes, absolutely, and I, and I loved it. I especially loved uh, Lily's opening song. I mean, it just captures everything, and and the piano music, the music is just gorgeous. When when you bring up Gillian Anderson and the film adaptation, um, was the presenting of the character of Rosedale in every other adaptation TV series, the movie uh, that I've seen, they remove Rosedale's Jewishness. Yes. They yes. just make it, you know, played by an Italian guy and uh, his suit's a little tight, you know, and, that, and then you're just, is that code? Are you supposed to know, you know, but, but they, be, they're afraid of, I guess, as, as I was made aware of, you know, of, of offending people or whatever. And so they just, they don't even use the word Jew. And that is really a, a devastating moment when someone in, in the house of mirth talks about him as the same old Jew who's being served up. Uh, that we've seen before <laughs> it's it's stunning it's a stunning nasty comment but it absolutely is appropriate you know yeah. well when i when i um started writing for for rosedale which was later when i was told i had to finish it. i'd written four songs for a workshop and somebody right. you know to finish it um i used the mode of speech that wharton used you know, sort of slang, you know, yep. a little bit on the Lower East Side side. And that yep. seemed fine to me, you know, and, and, and the, but my, my cohort of general, gen, generation X people, including my son and my music director said, you can't do that. I said, oh, okay. Um, so I looked around and I decided to model him more on Augustus Belmont. Yes, yes, that, and I think it fits. Who's somebody who he was earlier? He's somebody who made his uh, entry, entree into New York society. He did marry a society woman and uh, was accepted as an exceptional Jewish person. Right. right. Uh, you know, he he loved horses. That's where Belmont Park comes from. It's where Belmont Stakes comes from. He drove four in hand coaches, which was like driving race cars now i guess and yeah that was what they did that was pretty crazy that sport uh yeah dangerous and yeah very I, dangerous I think somewhere people got killed but anyway um so anybody was classy you know and he knew he knew how to how to get himself in there get the seat at the table but he was in the mid 19th century and that was before the big influx of right. uh refugees from russia and poland um, and that uh, was sort of cheating on my part, frankly, I have to say. Um, my way of subverting uh, Edith's caricature. But I, a, a question of how much of, of these insults and slurs and, and caricature and stereotype is seen th through the character side to a certain extent. You know, yes, Judy Trainer is a total bigot, 
So right. yes, she uses words that we're not even allowed to say. Right. Um, but then, you know, Edith's description of him is pretty... Oh, yeah, it's pretty awful. I mean, pretty she <laughs> sees him, she, she says that he sizes up people as if they were pieces of bric-a-brac. And she says she really sees him as as someone who is avaricious and well, he's an inferior. He comes from an inferior race. I mean, that word race keeps coming right. up all the way through the book. It's not about religion. It and this was, of course, the period when uh, people were were constructing these fake ideas about race, and there was all this uh, movement in the eugenics and. Uh, the you know and measuring people's heads and all this crazy stuff and so you know the book is can be seen as offensive but it is a it is a product of its time and there are some people who are some Wharton scholars who argue well Rosedale is actually the most sympathetic person because he is at the very end he's nicer to her uh, you know that's that's cold comfort. I mean, if that's what you're looking for, I think we have to accept that Wharton was anti-Semitic, and we know this. Hermione Lee, I think, is the best about this. Her biography really quotes some things that Wharton said that are just disgraceful. Um, even on her deathbed, I think she said something that was awful about Jews. I mean, why would you bother? I don't know. Um, I mean, what did Jews ever do to her? Um, but I'm sure they bought her books, uh, yeah. like everyone else did. I mean, the House of Mirth sold 150,000 copies in, what, a few months? Uh, she was a wild success. But, uh, you know, you if you can't accept that, um, if, you, if you believe that words themselves are violence, then obviously you can't accept a book like that. But, you know, again, I have to come back to my own experience. If someone tells me that those words in that book are violence, I'll say, well, my parents experience real violence i know what real violence is and i while words can be used to manipulate people to commit violence i don't see actual words as violence you know that's that's just my own experience and i know there are plenty of people who would disagree um, but i think you know i i love warden i mean i love her work despite that I love Henry James. I mean, Henry James has comments about Jews all in the Golden Bowl and some of his short stories. And, you know, both of those writers really inspired me to become the writer that I am today. I adored their work. And I think probably because one, because of the Gilded Age, but also because they were so different from who I was. You know, and I've and I've always as a writer found inspiration from writers who were different from me. I couldn't be any more unlike Joan Didion in my prose style, but I love reading her. Well, of course. I was interested in in Lily and Rosedale's kind of parallel worlds, both within the book and in Rosedale in Love. And they were both basically orphans as, you know, adults. Yes, and, yes. And they're both strivers for something that they don't have. Yes. Um, I love the cousins, you know, Gertie and Florence, who each show the... The, their cousins that it's possible to, to live another life it's possible yes, exactly to get out from under the the family and you know but you got to take risks mm -hmm. and um and neither of them can really do it and it was interesting that you had rosedale marry florence at the end <laughs> of course he married where florence. else what well, else is he going to do great. Um, and she adores you know. him and she's just a little schlubby that's all you know and and so we married. She wears with. beautiful clothes and jewels. So right. she knows how to she knows how to live, and she she's going to make him a wonderful wife. Yes, absolutely. And right. she is she is she will be his anchor in 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 a social world. And he may he may not ever be accepted by the 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 rest of that um, you know high society society but he will be accepted truly accepted in the world of german jews and the banking world there and that that will count for a lot and of course we know that people will be bugging him for tips for stock market tips it was interesting in in your book and i think i remember it from reading our crowd which i read i think when it came out oh yeah um, was uh was that the german jews used what we could consider slurs, anti-Semitic anti slurs against 
the non-German Jews. Yeah. That, that, you know, that they had to separate themselves. They had to make them the other. Yes. Um, and we're no more uh, immune to bigotry than the New York Waspy Society. No, absolutely. They had to be better than someone and they had to separate themselves from some this really they saw just like the non-jewish uh uh equals they saw these people as a horde you know mm -hmm. uh and at one point one out of five people and around that in the age of the house of mirth i think one out of five residents of new york city was foreign born and this created when wilson declared war against germany this created tremendous this un helped unleash tremendous xenophobia not just against germans or anyone who spoke German or said anything positive about Germany, but all foreigners. And many people were deported who were not German or Jewish. I mean, um, this is wonderful book called uh, American Midnight by Adam Hochschild. And it it's shocking. I mean, there was widespread violence, pogroms, uh, lynching, uh, surveillance, uh, America really went berserk after 1917 for a few years. And Wharton never wrote anything about it, which I think is really interesting. She was a foreigner herself by then, although she was talking about, about New York. But when she parked herself in Europe, you know, it was, it was, she, only thing she knew about America was what she read in the magazines. Right. As you say, Wharton made her choice to live abroad and it was a good choice for her because it helped her write and Henry James even though he knew she was living abroad and of course he was living in England he was the one who said do New York right and had he not said that she might not have written the age of innocence when when I first started talking to people like I was wandering around the Hudson Valley going into the Vanderbilt mansion and the Livingston Mills mansion in Statsburg Ooh, wonderful. they are fantastic um and these mansions still exist not only the mansions exist but all the stuff in them still exists yes as isn't... the third generation down the line people who couldn't pay the taxes said to the state or to the fed to the national parks department here just take it take just it like they did, just like they've done in england yeah so Might so you see like medici tapestries in things and and just the most so to me it was like well this is my set you know, I just yes. have to get get pictures. But when I started talking to the people at um, Livingston Mills Mansion uh, near Rhinebeck, um, and they said, well, what's it about? And I said, well, it's really about the commodification of beauty, right. and, which we still have. Yeah. Oh, like yes. Billions and billions of dollars spent on stuff that's supposed to make you more beautiful. I have to tell you that the women readers in my classes, women students in my classes related so much to Lily Bart trying to please men. She said, we're still doing it. She said, we don't dress like her, but we're still doing the same thing or we're pushed to do the same thing. Right. Or you're worried if you don't do the same thing. Exactly. So I so, so but then I started thinking about Rosedale and after I read Rosedale in Love, you know, and felt more of where he was in terms of being a, a financier, mm -hmm. uh, that things are commodities. And 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 for for Rosedale, Lily is a commodity. Mm -hmm. For Lily, her whole cult of beauty that she has expensively to keep up in order to be a product that can be sold to the right husband you know so they they both they have to make these calculations and that, that's another thing that they really have in common um is calculating every move of how this is going to affect their survival. market value their market market value, value. yeah really it's, it's true it's true it's they're true. always aware of their their position in society and and are they going up? Are they going down? Are they oh, just uh, uh, um, staying level? Or, you know, it's, they're so, they're so similar. I mean, their traps are so similar. And they both make these terrible blunders. Absolutely. Though Absolutely. I think Lily's, a lot of Lily's, you know, it's because of Selden who keeps turning up at the wrong time and reminding her that she, he, she actually has feelings. Yes. That she can't calculate with. And so she's always self-sabotaging. Mm -hmm. you know, she doesn't go to church when she's supposed to go to church and then you know the whole that whole thing with Percy Grice flies out the window yep 
imagine being married to Percy Grace for the rest of your life. See, uh, see, Wharton's comedy in creating these awful characters is wonderful. I was very close to my great aunt who was born in 1902. So she had a sort of a Edwardian childhood. Um, uh -huh. One thing was when she was very old, like 92, um, she reverted to the kind of anti-Semitism that she had known as a child. Really? As an adult, she had Jewish friends, neighbors, cousins, you know, it, it, it never crossed her lips. But when she was really old and starting to go a little gaga, underneath there was that level of those people, you know, the people who bought the farm next to hers was like, you know, those people. And it wasn't that overt, but you could feel it. And you just think, okay, this is 1907 talking. You know, this is what she, mm -hmm. she was a little mm -hmm. kid. And mm -hmm. that has always been under there, but she, you know, learned better, suppressed it or whatever, but it's still under there. Which well, and it's still it's still here. I mean, except now Jews have space lasers. <laughs> when are we going to get our rocket? So what's our obligation to the works of an author that we admire or revere who is capable of saying stuff that's just a slap in the face? But we pretty much talked about that. Um, you take what's good about them. You right, know? you take what's good about them and you make sure if you especially if you're teaching that you give students context, okay? Because not all my students understood that that how uh deeply embedded in stereotype Rosedale's character was. And um so we talked about anti-Semitism and it was a real see, this is a thing. If you cut it out, you miss the opportunity to talk about um prejudice especially in terms of classism and class anxiety. And so the discussions were really, really important in that seminar. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time on them, but they learned a lot about the period so that they're not getting a whitewashed view of American history and American literature. And also that as much as you dislike it, the prejudice against Rosedale is a vital part of the plot. Exactly, exactly. If if he wasn't Jewish and if people didn't look down on him, then, you know, in chapter one, oh, Mr. Rosedale, what are you <laughs> doing? Do you want to get married? Because I love Jews. Some of my best friends are Jews. And he says, sure, Lily, you know, uh, we could just run away to uh, Niagara Falls or whatever. Uh, I don't think they ran away to Las Vegas back then, but, you know, it, where's the book? I mean, it's it is a, an important part of the book, and I don't know how conscious Edith Wharton was about that side of it, uh, but it's there. No, it's I think a plot it's, driver. It's, it's, you have to understand what he's up against. Yep. You have to understand what that would put her up against if she did marry him. Yes. Because one of the things when I when I first started this, it was a workshop, and I had not read House of Mirth. Oh, okay. um, it was a workshop on turning novels into musicals and in mu musicals you have to really distill everything down especially if you're doing a song cycle and you like throughout the book right um, the songs have to take you from point to point to point mm -hmm. and the thing about house of mirth the first time i read it i cried <laughs> you know mm. like oh no poor lily the second time i read it i still cried but it was the structure where it's like she walks into this Chinese I was with Chinese box I don't even know that even a exists. puzzle box you mean like a puzzle box so that like everywhere she gets she goes to some place and it door slams and then she goes right. to place and the door slams it's kind of a maze too yeah yeah but a maze it's with trapped. slamming doors because yep. yep. you really don't have any hope of getting out of it and right when you get to the end and she's really climbed down the socioeconomic ladder um some people say oh well maybe she didn't mean to kill herself but um I, as the as the adapter, I had to say you had to make a choice. It, yeah. I had to make a choice. So there's no song and there's no end. Right. Oh, so, um. Like, oh, oops, she made she overdosed. It, it's not. It's it's it has to have been a decision. One of the things when I showed the show to my son, um, before anybody else had pretty much seen it, I showed it to my family, and uh, he said, "You can't do that character." You know? mm -hmm why you know you know he, he can't use the word jew so i said well that's that's what he that's what they call him 
He has mm -hmm. to deal with what they call him. He has to deal mm -hmm. with, you know, yes, he's probably not religious. He probably hasn't done anything oh, he's... since they probably skipped his bar mitzvah. His family was so dysfunctional. Um, but again, it's the it's the Generation X thing. They are so super sensitized for others. Mm -hmm. And and there still are horrible people coming out in public blaming Jews for everything. Uh, which I still, you know, I just keep thinking, you know, wait, what century are we in? Not even what decade. Um, so you can't take it for granted, but you also can't uh, obliterate. Yeah, you can't. As and no. not in certainly not in this show because it is a functional part of the of, of the story. God, how he is treated, how the society treats him, right. is parallel to how Lily is treated, and it puts him where he is in this super awkward position. And I love my generation x family and friends of course you know, i love that they are so intolerant of intolerance um but there's got to be a way to present these thorny issues so we have the disclaimer at the beginning of the mm -hmm. show about bigotry anti-semitism racism drug abuse and sexual suicide. harassment you know it's all there <laughs> welcome right. to house of mirth but you got to deal with it and so in aiming more towards Augustus Belmont that kind of got me off some of the difficulties of of dealing with um, Edith's, I call her Edith, mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like I know her so well, um, of Wharton's um, own personal prejudices and portraying the prejudices of the people in society that make the plot happen, you know, mm -hmm. without him being the other and their prejudice against him, as you said, you know, it would be great, Mr. and Mrs. Rosedale. She wear diamonds like a queen. Um, <laughs> I love his vision of her, that he would set her above everybody who has ever uh, talked down to her. And she and he thinks she'd of have, her. She'd have her revenge. Thing. Yes, yeah, yes. Unfortunately, it's Edith, Edith is having her revenge. I think she's having a revenge on every girl who is pretty, prettier than her. Revenge on the intolerance of society and mm -hmm. and i don't think she's having a revenge on rosedale i think that's ingrained somehow and she doesn't it's ingrained she's right blind to it she doesn't even see it she doesn't but, see it no. but um as irene goldman pointed out in the article the perfect jew he's the only one who doesn't do her harm it's not right. sort of nice to her at the end everybody else you know slanders her molests her uses her uses her steals her money uh just dis disinherits her all this stuff and 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 rosedale's kind of a is it in music obligato you know it's this sort of right that's, underneath that's it's that's like well he's still way, there yeah. and, and he's right he's a threat all the way through the book and what tries would try to help her if he if she would let him right but she won't but she also has to do something by using the letters. She has to do something that would humiliate her right. and would hurt Selden. Hurt so, Selden. and she's in love with Selden. So it's, I think Wharton has given her in a wonderfully complicated uh, dilemma to deal with. And, and it destroys her because a lesser woman would have said, yeah, you want the letters? Sure. But, you know, they're yours. Save me save me mr rosedale right. but she doesn't do it and i think it's like i think it's psychologically astute um in terms of everything that she's created about the character well she has lily has this you know this still small voice you know yes. that she's 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 working on the sables and lace and all the stuff that she supposedly has to do and man those the the, the you were supposed to change clothes three times a day and there everything thing was supposed to be beautiful and this huge corset and all that stuff that you're distorting yourself and spending more money than you have and putting yourself in you know awkward positions about money but but she knows that it's not worthy of her right the still small voice so yeah. she gets to the point where she again with percy grice with uh obviously she's not going to allow Gus Trainer to molest her, but some people would, you know, for the money. She, some people would, and I left out the letters out of the song itself because I couldn't figure out 
how to do it in such yeah, a they're tricky way. and the char lady <laughs> like description in the book where they see the first see the char lady she's like the polar opposite of lily uh -huh. and, and her the the resentment and the all that stuff that it's it, it's pretty horribly classist of course as well it's funny when you do song cycles you start to get a sense of what sings mm. how would this how would this be a song because i didn't leave myself any hardly any room for dialogue mm. um and i couldn't make the char lady sing it's just i i don't know so well, if we do the if we do it as a whole musical, that'll be somebody Maybe. else's problem. Well, um, yeah, as Sondheim might have been able to do it. I mean, if he could make uh, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street, but uh, <laughs> but uh, and Mrs. Lovett, um, a lot of what I was able to do was based on the fact that it all came from the same album by the same composer. Mm -hmm. So as I was thinking about, I had the album before I did the workshop right and uh and that made me cry it was, it was a pretty emotional time back in the, the early 2000s but the music some of the music just actually absolutely were you know oh that's the song for that part or that's the song mm -hmm. for that part. Mm -hmm. when i figured out how to do all those door slamming basically in one number which is the quadrille sextet right. the, bar, the barroom scene um, that's just condensing I, so much it all in one place that basically I could leave out the the boat trip and Bertha and George Dorset and all mm -hmm. that stuff because mm -hmm. it, it's all kind of in there. And it may not seem enough to, for somebody to commit suicide on, but for a song cycle, it worked pretty well. Yep, yep. The whole way everything flowed together and the creation of the pastiche stuff that that I kind of developed because I didn't really have a choice. As you can see from our beautiful sofa, which is here in the mount, and we are not, it worked. It worked well, and I actually expanded what I was ever thinking of doing. These were just supposed to be like concerts, staged reading, uh -huh. and uh, they turned into something else entirely, which I'm pretty grateful for. This is also kind of based on Irene Goldman's article, and I have to say, I met with her and. I'm so grateful for her input and that somebody steered me th towards that article because uh -huh. I really didn't know how to proceed um once the Gen Xers told me I couldn't I had to find a way to not tone it down it. yeah so we did tone it down a little bit I right. uh, it was important to me as we were making the pastiche version that uh when somebody was thinking about Lily their image of Lily rather than her being supposedly in the same room because right, everyone right. was in the same room. So so this kind of natural recording uh was fine for when she was in you know in there with him. But then they'd be thinking about her. Selden would be thinking about her. Edith would be thinking about her. Rosedale would be thinking about her. So we made that have a sort of a, a ghostly apparition kind of uh -huh. role, so that you knew she wasn't in that room. But she was, and what she was, what they is what they saw their projection. How they saw her, her yeah. not her, but you know, and so much, her. and it's perfect because so much about the House of Mirth is about being seen, being seen, being observed, and Lily is always aware of herself as an object, as a commodity, but as the object of scrutiny. You know, and she has right. to be perfect. She has to be successful. She has to do what her mother wanted to her to do, even though she knows it's beneath her. And Rosedale is the same. I mean, he is the, you know, eternal Jewish stereotype or uh, that. And he's always being seen as lesser than he is. And Lily has gotten to the point where that's happening for her too. I mean, she's not she's not as entertaining as she was before. She's her beauty may be fading. Um, her eyes may not be as beautiful as they were. She needs more support from other people. She's more willing to do things that they know are demeaning. I mean, making her answer people's letters, you know, she, turning her into a secretary, turning her into a servant, just a higher class servant. Right, and then. That she can, she only exists in society as an illusion. Yes. You know, if you think about what, 
what a woman looks like when she's not wearing a corset and 50 pounds of cloth of cloth and jewels and all that stuff she's just you know she's just a person right but it's the illusion that she has to create that is for sale mm -hmm. and it's an expensive mm -hmm. illusion so that was part of of making the sort of apparition view of her in the in the show and also knowing when the two characters were actually interacting and when they you were looking at their idea of her yeah ideas of each other well and that's that's part of what how what goes wrong in the book for them is that they have ideas of each other which are really not realistic right why would and, they want that why would you want realism yeah exactly and mm -hmm. but can you can you imagine if they had married i mean i just I, her meeting his family his being you know frowned on as he carts her around and shows off her jewels i mean it just i it's just hard to it's hard to picture it would have been a tough tough road to hoe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yet it's she's i guess because of her shame because of her family's financial downturn um she really can't risk being poor no absolutely you know, she, not. she can't make her she'll do anything and it, when she realizes that nothing's going to work, she kills herself, mm -hmm. which, you know, she has no, in a certain way, she has no self-esteem that, that can sustain her without, without the money. Right. So that wonderful scene where even though she has been disinherited, she wants to be seen having tea uh, out among the society swells because she doesn't want people to think she's hiding. She can't even afford to go out anymore. Right, but she can't afford to hide either. Absolutely, yep. And so much of the book is about the uh, about concealment and secrets, and it's really it's really a magnificent book. I think I probably read it five, six, seven times, and it always gets deeper for me. Again, that's the great thing about a great book is that as you grow, it grows with you. Right. What you what you read in college in your twenties, and you come back and you're 40s and then you come back in your <clears throat> 60s and uh, yeah that's they could be almost completely different books well my so, hope is one of the things one of the reasons why i wrote rosedale in love is my hope is that uh down the road when people teach the house of mirth they will teach it side by side with rosedale in love because i certainly hope so i think they should be packaged together well it's out there it's on amazon uh you read it on kindle like i did Yes, yes. And the audiobook is just gorgeous. I mean, I could listen to it forever. Even though I wrote it, I wrote the words. So we talked about House of Mirth, the that perhaps not even consciously that Edith writes Rosedale to be the best person among the major characters in terms of being um true to his feelings for her for for uh not trashing her or or attacking her or any of the things that other people do that maybe Edith's soul as a writer of great of human frailty um was greater than her own prejudice I think that's a good way of putting it because he is a stereotype and yet, at the same time, he's not an awful human being, which I think is an, is a, a, a remarkable achievement for a writer to pull off. Which is pretty much all the other characters are awful human oh, beings. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and even Selden, I mean, Selden, you know, he's, he he really fails. He really fails her. He does. He comes in too late. He does. And he could, you know, but she also, she had a chance and she pushed him away because you know and the way I did it in the in the pastiche was you know she she he's an he's an esthete he has these you know, wonderful things he loves her partly right. because she's so beautiful right um but in among all these beautiful things um you know you pan down and there are these like books that are just moldering away and 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 she realizes that she's not going to get that surface beauty that she was brought up to uh aspire to she wants yeah. extravagance and selden is not extravagant no well and he's just he's just managing for himself you right. know he's not gonna ever build a chateau um 
And that's not what she was designed for, even though he's she also, might have been, God forbid, she should be happy. Yeah, he's also too quiet. I mean, he's he's not showy. He's too quiet. He's too self-contained. He's just not the right person for her to marry, even though she loves him. Right. And, she, and even he, though he loves her. So, I mean, that, he sits back and watches. And yes. Judges, but still, he goes to the dinners. He goes to the party. He has an affair with Bertha Dorset um you know of all people right of all people so you know he's he's he also fails her utterly and um i don't think that rosedale does and and maybe she's a better human being than her upbringing would have led her to be i think I'm so sure. well and i think she is because when she's about to grab percy grice she she unconsciously sabotages it and and it's noted about her that anytime she's about to make a score she undercuts herself right. and that's the part of lily that is the best part of her it is it, is. And that's, it and, makes you sad when she dies because otherwise it's you know edith's revenge um so what do we do about literature that offends us or that the times mostly have changed where that language is offensive. Um, you know, we can turn a blind eye to it. We can uh, cancel them and, and throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, or we can see it as an opportunity to uh, understand how different that time was. And I think it can, it offers the opportunity to have really valuable discussions about the things that we find offensive and intolerable um, and not look away from them, not fail to engage with them. As I said earlier, I think, you know, one of the greatest uh, best classes I, I taught teaching Wharton was discussing anti-Semitism in the context, not just of classism, but of general prejudice in the Gilded Age against the Irish, uh, against Slavs, against uh, um, uh, Italian Catholics. I mean, the, the world was changing and people were really uh, up in arms about it. And, you know, that's happened all the way through American history. See, that's the thing. You have to link it to all the fear uh, over the centuries of people who are different. Yeah. You know? And we see this today around people who are Mexican. You know, it so it connects us in a way that might be uncomfortable to some people, but is really important. It's important to know our history as it really was and our literature as it really was, and who these people who wrote it were, and not shy away from the truth. I think that's a good place to end. Uh, thank you so much, Liv Raphael, for your wonderfully complex uh, assessment of the problem. And uh, hopefully we can look forward to more conversations amongst you all about these difficult subjects. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me and thank you for writing just a gorgeous, gorgeous song cycle. I'm a big fan of art music and art, art song. And I just, I just ate it up. Oh, that's what we like to hear. Right. Thanks very much. Take care. You too.